Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup. We have done this 40 times. So this is our 40th meetup. And I was recently looking actually on the website and I saw that we have over a thousand subscribers on um, meetup.com. So we've kind of um, kept this thing going. And, and the reason is because we always have so many fascinating people and topics that um, relate in some way to cloud computing and what is interesting about what people are doing with cloud computing. So today I'm really excited about this meetup. Um, we have a great topic for you today and I'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but first let's do some uh, welcome and announcements. Um, so big thank you to all of our planners. That's Berkeley IT, Citrus and the Banatow Institute, um, CDSS, the Division for Computing Data Science and Society, uh, we have help from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and Research IT, as well as our ongoing relationship with Berkeley Skydeck. Uh, Amy, did you want to do the announcement about the women in data science? Yeah, definitely. I added this. Um, so we have our Women in Data Science Berkeley event coming up on Tuesday, March 7th. Um, this is uh, in person. It's been a few years since we've been able to be in person. Full day event, um, a lot of really great speakers. And everybody is invited. Um, it's uh, everybody of all gender orientations and expressions. The idea is really just to uplift the voices of um, women doing research and work in data science. So all of the speakers will be um, women, but please come. And I will drop the link to that in the chat in a few minutes. And as the uh, meetup has progressed, the other thing is that we used to be planning the meetup in the month, which actually happened this month, but uh, we're now we have agenda a couple months out. Um, I don't think Jeff is here, but Jeff, if you are here, maybe you could give the, is Jeff here? Because he could talk about next month. Um, he's bringing someone from Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So that should be very interesting. Um, but then in April, we're going to have our first uh, critical conversation around chat GPT. And so one of the themes that our planning group talked about for the meetup was to expand the format to get into deeper conversations around really critical areas. And you know, it's the hot topic of 2022, 2023, uh, ChatGPT and some of the implications of AI. So we're working on this. It may end up being a series of discussions because it's there's so much to cover. Uh, and we'll be tapping into um, Berkeley uh, academic expertise to sort of deepen the conversation. So we're really looking forward to that in April and we're hard at work planning the agenda. So by all means, if any of you have ideas uh, for how you'd like to see us take that throat in the chat uh, or feel free to email Amy or me or, or mm -hmm. Anthony. Okay. All Amy. right. So um, let's do a quick poll. If everybody could go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com and you'll be prompted to enter this code. 74096573. You could throw that in the chat, Bill. That would be helpful. It's actually also going to be on this next page, so don't panic that it went away. So here it is up here on the top, 74096573. And we always like to know who is here, who's in the room today. So what part of the community are you from? Uh-huh, other UC campus. That's a, a new category we added last time. Somebody pointed out we were missing that. Nine. Got a lot of IT staff as usual, student. Nine. What's that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So very IT staff heavy, which we usually are, but um, especially today, welcome to our guests. Let's move on to the next question. How familiar with augmented reality are you? So we've got a couple different options here. I've interacted with or used it. I know what it is, but I've never used it. I've heard the term before, but I'm not sure what it is, or I have no idea what AR is. Mm -hmm. Nice. So it looks like a fair amount of people have used it and know what it is. And a few folks are new. This is perfect. 
Nice. Okay, cool. I hope you like the new color scheme of the poll too. That's feeling <laughs> changing it up. Okay, so this is related to what Bill was saying about the critical conversations that we're planning. Um, so we're going to be tackling chat GPT, but what other new and hot and controversial topics should we critically discuss at a meetup? Yeah, I was typing that as you said that, uh, inferring awesome. that, that you were looking for other topics. So like, oh, that was my number one. <laughs> so that's good confirmation. We're, we're on track. <laughs> I don't know if I should leave it off or I put it in. <laughs> Oh, put it in. Let's build the word cloud. Sure. <laughs> cloud security. Hello to our friends from the information security office I see here. <laughs> okay, AI, agree. AI generated art. That's a good point. Got a couple AI for arts. It's certainly been all over my Instagram feed. Cybersecurity, cloud security. Okay, lots of security stuff, Bill. This is interesting. Multi-cloud security, open AI. I like this. So we have some big topics and then some kind of diving deeper into specific aspects of these. And I will say we do actually use this data from these polls. We're actually gonna be embarking on a kind of like mining the data from all 40 of these meetups and we'll have something fun to show in the future. But um, okay, orchestration, Kubernetes, agree. Okay, machine learning, nice, science DMZ. Speaking my language, okay, nice, thank you. These are fantastic ideas. And like I said, we will, actually use these and will help plan. Um, okay, so jumping back over, uh, back over to you, Bill. Okay, great. Um, so right, this meetup today is going to feature uh, conversations that tie in with augmented reality, podcasting and ethnic studies. So I'm gonna start by introducing Dr. Pablo Gonzalez and I'll let him introduce the students we'll be hearing from also today. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez is a continuing lecturer in Chicanx and Latinx studies and ethnic studies. He's got his PhD from UT Austin and a BA in Chicano studies from UC Berkeley. He's the, um, so he's a lecturer. He was the recipient of the 2022 Distinguished Teaching Award at UC Berkeley. He also uh, won a 2020 CTO Berkeley Changemaker Technology Innovation Grant. And some of the work that they have done with this has just been phenomenal. Um, he's the director of the Ethnic Studies Changemaker Project, and you can visit them at ssbc.berkeley.edu, and we'll put that in the chat. I've personally been incredibly inspired by Pablo's vision and the work of the Scaffolding Stories and Building Communities Project, and uh, his overall approach to what I would say is operationalizing ethnic studies. Um, you know, this is real hands-on, boots-on-the-ground work with real people in, in, impacting things like K-12 schools in the Bay Area and with this ethos of empowering people through technology. So the project works collaboratively uh, in ethnic studies between faculty, students, community partners, um, and it focuses on amplifying voices uh, and diverse experiences of marginalized communities and other people who don't necessarily have access to those things. So this project has increased accessibility and has created a space, both virtual and real spaces, uh, for creativity and empowerment. So Pablo, I will hand it over to you, and you can talk about your students and the three focus areas, and you have the floor. Thank you, Bill. Um, first of all, it's, it really, much of this has to do with the support that uh, you and your team have have given us over the last three or four years, since right before COVID, right? 2020, around since 2020. And um, when looking at uh, the podcast studio and everything that we've now been able to do since then, um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's been incredible, especially with much of uh, our team, not as experienced in uh, podcasting or augmented reality. But I think that's the beauty of it, especially with the, uh, kind of work that Berkeley students are known for, to really drive themselves, to push themselves and to think and ask questions. 
the next set of questions that um, I know when it comes to uh, tech and accessibility, but also in telling our stories is so uh, crucial. I do have one of, uh, one of our team members here, uh, Nigel Hawkins, uh, who just joined the team just recently and who is both working on the AR uh, app uh, construction and work that is part of the Berkeley Collegium Grant that we received this last year to look at uh, the digital divide on the Berkeley campus and in the Bay Area. So we're expanding this question of ethnic studies to a digital divide in terms of uh, having students create podcasts um, around different issues uh, concerning the digital divide. So some folks are working on, for instance, looking at the digital divide in native reservations. Others are looking at it in terms of gender um, and race in universities, um, especially around like computer science or in, in the broader STEM field. Um, and then, you know, even in K through 12. So uh, we're hoping to have like a, a hope about six or seven series, podcast series, depending on um, the, the number uh, by the end of the spring to showcase uh, the different topics, uh, um, including uh, the voices of students on this campus. But Nigel, I'll, I'll hand it over for, uh, for you to uh, introduce yourself um, as part of the team, yeah? Hello, everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Pablo. Uh, my name is Nigel Hawkins. Um, I study sociology and I'm a senior at UC Berkeley. And um, uh, with sociology, it's brought my mind to a place where um, I've found out different ways I can contribute. And I definitely want to be able to um, contribute for someone like me, you know what I mean? Um, a person of color. And, um, and I've recognized with um, technology, um, we've every, everything's been going pretty fast as far as um as where we're going and where we're heading in society and um in the midst of that um culture is something that um suffers and that's something i've recognized within my community and and you know other other institutions that i've been a part of and so with this podcast I'm, um um that i've been given the the blessing of being able to create um it's it's basically a a a vessel for everyone to be able to express um, their journey and what they recognize about the community and what 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 is still there and what what's been taken away and um and um it's made me very much um passionate about seeking different ways of how we can preserve the culture and so i want to do that with my podcast but i've also been a part of this project um where we were creating an app and um, I definitely want to see how we can um, um, use use this app as a as a way that we can show people in a in a in a techno, uh, AR form, um, you know, uh, what used to be in a specific area, or you know, and how it was before it's washed away. And um, you know, it's just definitely um, a blessing to me to be a part of this stuff because this is all some things that I'm passionate about, and um, I'm just glad to be here today. Thank you, Nigel. And Nigel's also from, I think, an area that we all know is uh, deep within the, the industry here in the Bay Area um, in, in East Palo Alto. So when we're talking about uh, how we're impacted around much of what's happening um, in our communities, uh, it's both the access of some of these communities that are adjacent to some of the huge companies and also startups of the Bay Area and what that means to people living in parts of, for instance, Silicon Valley and so forth. So we, I think in, in that, uh, the podcasts will highlight some of that, especially for neighborhoods in the Bay Area and also throughout California. Um, and aside from that, he's also working on that, uh, as he mentioned, sociological lens, which we'll talk about in a second um, of, of the project. Now, I wanted just to, we only, we came up with a couple of slides, so it's not too many slides to bore you all, but it was, it was just to kind of show us where we've been. And I, I'll just mention that, and, and Bill knows this, that I began really this journey around looking at, for instance, augmented reality, uh, thinking that augmented reality was already being used in so many different ways, especially around social media. So we have augmented reality being used in the context of filters, um, of all kinds of different ways that people um, 
you know, uh, social media games, uh, games that like uh, Pokemon Go, things of that nature that people um, spread throughout um, different continents. I remember seeing Pokemon Go played for the first time in Barcelona, Spain, while I was uh, teaching summer abroad. Um, and a family that I asked uh, coming from Frankfurt, uh, who was on vacation in Barcelona, playing Pokemon Go. So the very reach of these different app, um, apps and games and, and understanding that AR could be a way to tell stories as well. And, and the introduction to AR emerged in part with several uh, projects that I was a part of, or at least um, forums. Uh, one of them was uh, designated for faculty on this campus, the Adobe uh, uh, Fellows Program. The uh, Gene Cheng and uh, Victoria Robinson were headed were heading a couple years ago, and it was to try to use, uh, for instance, the Adobe Creative Cloud uh, in the curriculum uh, to be able to construct and and uh, deepen uh, the learning outcomes for students using the many um, apps and programs that the Creative Cloud offers. So Premiere Pro, uh, Photoshop, uh, in, in my case, Adobe Audition, when it comes to editing podcasts. And what I ended up learning from uh, engagement with the Adobe Creative Cloud and the uh, kind of Ad Adobe ecosystem uh, was an entire network of scholars and practitioners and teachers throughout the United States that were using it to uh, build and showcase and highlight knowledge production, especially of their students. In my case, I saw this really interesting pro uh, project coming out of uh, Winston-Salem University, which was, I think, a, an Adobe school. And they were using InDesign, Adobe InDesign, to create digital journals for their students, digital journals on their work and portfolios. So I said, I, I think my courses could do this, especially since I always have a main major project coming out of my classes. And so one of the uh, major projects of this was a journal, a, digit a digital journal that showcased the oral histories and research papers, in particular of my immigration class. We are now, uh, we're working on our third edition. So we're working on our third uh, uh, version of this. We have two that have come out over the last two years. And it, to me is, um, a wonderful example. Let me see if I can uh, show you just a little bit of it. Um, this is a bit of what it looks like. Um, it has the name of, for instance, the person who's uh, is it was interviewed. Most of them are oral histories of parents, family members, people who have um, experienced migrating to the United States from wherever it might be, uh, with the focus on Mexican and Central American migration but it, in particular from other places. And it was a place for them to, to showcase and highlight the lives of people that were dear to my students. And I have to say, the, there's a sentimental value here that I very much uh, uh, highlighted in the class. That is, do not let the opportunity to record and to document and to, and to show the oral histories of your community and your family go to waste. If they're here, document them, hold them for future generations. It's one of those things that I remember as a Berkeley undergrad, um, having the opportunity to document the uh, stories of my grandmother who migrated to the United States in the, in the 1960s. And I now have, for instance, audio tapes that my me and my cousin have of interviewing my grandmother so we can hear her voice um, and hear the stories that she would tell about coming to this country. So the opportunity then to digitize it and have it available is something that I think uh, our communities and our families now can hold and say, we are now part of um, the University of California and so forth. So we were very much inspired by that work. But the other part that I think is unique to this project is the fact that I wanted to add a different element to it. And that element was augmented reality. And the reason for that was that augmented reality could actually help people um, incorporate uh, uh, photos, mementos, things that were digitized or scanned uh, that showcased, again, the, the stories of these uh, families and these individuals. And 
augmented reality might be able to give you, uh, again, another layer of information and another form of archiving these stories, um, especially when it comes to video um, and adding other assets like audio. So for instance, I have these two examples that I just recorded real quick from uh, the use of the application that we use was Artivive, which I know that Bill and others have, um, have used or at least talked about and that certain parts of this campus use like places in art and design use, especially around art uh, to give uh, a different, again, a different layer to the kind of work that students are, are conducting. So I'll just show you real quick. Uh, 99. El 70 decidió él que nos iba a traer porque no quería que sus hijos. So just in that quick 10 seconds, because Artivive allows you to record about 10 seconds, um, students are able to put uh, other images, other videos, audio of the interview that they conducted onto the image. And using Artivive, people can get, again, more of an expanded view of these oral histories. They could also incorporate what Artivive is used for mostly is for artists to expand it using uh, 2D or 3D um, or just animation or some form of uh, special effect. And so in this case, one student learned how to uh, use after, Adobe After Effect to, to have like butterflies flap their wings and then kind of give a 2D effect, yeah? So these are two ways that students used images uh, that they collected, old photos, and each of the old photos in the digitized, uh, in the digital journal have an AR Artivive component. So it's, it's a, I guess, a, a journal within a journal, in a sense. You have an archiving that happens here. And so we were really excited that now we're in our third edition, it's being edited right now, uh, of doing what that kind of Now, the other part of this is what we started to use, um, again, in regards to Adobe Arrow, uh, using, again, part of the Adobe ecosystem. One of the less known uh, part of that ecosystem is their AR component, which is Arrow. Uh, and, and in Arrow, we wanted uh, to make it more mobile. We wanted to uh, talk about this question about, um, about monuments and archiving and stories, um, and doing so by thinking about the UC Berkeley campus as a site of so many different stories, not just the official ones that you might find on a tour, but the ones that students, especially students of color might have as they walk around this campus. And right now in our studio, um, the part of Black Studies Consortium um, or laboratory has been doing a lot of recordings having to do with um, the history of Black students and staff and faculty on the campus. Um, and we've been helping them work on podcasts and other uh, projects. And so we wanted really to do this, but through AR. Um, and with Arrow, one of the places that we started to think about or that we had to think about in constructing this was the question of distance and scale. That is um, how to be able to use uh, mobile uh, augmented reality uh, to, to, for students to be able to walk through campus and using Arrow and then um, be able to have augmented reality uh, scenes appear uh, that give information either at the touch of a screen or upon uh, proximity to the, to the actual asset. Um, and this is something that we're still trying to figure out, especially around scale, because we wanted to make it visible but also um, have enough information for folks um, as they appear to it. Um, it's similar to a, a QR code, because this is how you would apply a, a Adobe Arrow. But in this case, the QR code gives you um, the opportunity to open Arrow and create a similar uh, scene like this one. And this is a, an actual mural that we digitized and that we haven't found a place to put on the campus but that students in my summer class about a year and a half ago constructed in terms of uh, each of these panels having an augmented reality effect. Um, so I'll just play a quick one uh, around this. And this, we put this outside of the social science building. In 1999, folks in the UC Berkeley community- The volume's a little low on this one. Of the third world 
appropriation point and demanded that the university invest in culturally relevant and vital education for communities of color. Following a hunger strike, protesters won nine demands to secure the longevity and strength of the ethnic studies department, improve student diversity, admonish student protesters, and secure long-term execution of the agreements reached. Among the demands was the agreement to install a mural in Barrow Hall. Protesters envisioned the mural as part of a shift in the visual language now, and culture of UC Berkeley campus. Again, you can barely hear it, but uh, but but in, with, what we did was we included audio that upon the proximity to this mural, which is actually to scale, each of these panels is around six by nine feet or something like that. Um, and we made sure that each of the panels was precisely to the scale that they're actually uh, physically in form and then place them how they, how the artists, the muralists wanted them to appear. And because we haven't found a space on campus to actually put them physically, AR can be a way to actually still have the murals now appear. And upon, for instance, touching on a mobile device like a tablet or a phone with Adobe Arrow, uh, if you touch the, the particular panel, each panel will describe the panel, give you a little sense of history of, of the, the historical figures on the panel um, and give you an overall connection uh, here. The connection in this case is the history of ethnic studies on this campus stemming from the 1969 student strike. And so in this context, we wanted to be able um, to create these different scenes on campus using, for instance, Sprout Hall. The other one that we used is uh, the famous MLK speech in the mid 60s um, that he gave on Sprout Hall um, using some of the audio from that MLK speech so that people can hear him give that speech. Um, and actually see uh, um, digital archive photos. Um, and we also, for instance, use California Hall, uh, protests that have happened, for instance, in California Hall and so forth. So we've done a lot of different things to give this alternative history, this other campus kind of history of, of the Berkeley campus. Um, and this is what we're working on as one of the projects for the Collegium Grant. Um, and with that Collegium Grant is also the, one of the things that we wanted to discuss with you, which is the question of producing a prototype, because one of the limitations of using Artivive and Arrow is that we have to deal with their limitations, right? Whatever their intended use is for. That is, Artivive is for predominantly artists. I have used it for everything other than art. <laughs> I've used it for like photography. Uh, I've even used it for, um, the uh, plywood murals in, during the uh, George Floyd protests a couple of years ago that one of my classes produced a gallery of um, where you can physically use arrow and some of the storefronts and it would produce an AR just by pointing it at a physical space, not necessarily like a art, 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 art piece or something. And so we're th we wanna create our own prototype so that we can hold this like uh, using some form of cloud uh, service to be able to hold assets and create this so that students have access to them and be able to have access to these uh, different, uh, I think, uh, learning tools, um, both in ethnic studies, but also uh, that are available to other units on campus. Um, Nigel, you wanna mention some of the discussions that you all have been having as you've been uh, brainstorming? Uh, yeah, you know, we've had, um, you know, th this um, this project has given us a, a chance to um, put some of our dreams and, and the creativity in the front forefront. And um, uh, if I could think of one in particular, it would be that um, I recognize that Martin Luther King actually did a speech at UC Berkeley. And, and uh, I thought about how great that would be to um, recreate that scene of where exactly he was standing, um, how cool it would be if someone could just bring up their phone and they could hear, you know, uh, the the volume of the crowd that was there, what he was talking about and everything. Um, but we've also thought about using this um, app to make it just a, a, a funner or more interactive um, um, way of learning. And, uh, and one of the um, places that we'd like to start off was uh, in the ethnic studies um, library. And, um, and uh, yeah, we wanted to be able to use our phones and um, 
walk through this space or make it a situation where you don't even actually have to be there. And you can, um, you know, probably go through some of the aisles in this library and the, in the, um, in, in the Asian department and, you know, um, Chicano area and everything in there, you, you'd get a, um, you know, a firsthand look at how everything was in reality, real time without even having to do too much. And yeah, that, that's some of the um, uh, ideas that we have so far. And then hopefully um, making our way out of the library onto the campus and then maybe even into the community itself. Um, it, it was it, one of the one of the inspirations because I'm a Star Wars nerd is the that the scene at the Jedi Temple where they're they're looking you know at the libraries and somehow you appear to the you know the universe appears or the galaxies appear right so to be able to use the library and the li different libraries on campus in particular here the ethnic studies library as uh, a place where you can have either QR or or other forms of uh, to 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 have AR assets and add more information, whether it be through sound, similar to what you would find in a museum that now uses AR or uh, QRs and so forth. Um, and so that's that's kind of one of the ideas that we wanted to create, especially on on particular archives, to be able to work on particular archives um, in the library, um, so that they so that they so the students can gather questions from them while they're gathering information from this for, uh, primary uh, documents. Um, this, let me go back to this last scene. This, this is uh, a survey that Nigel and uh, some of the other team members, uh, Liz Toledo, Winston, uh, uh, Kai and, and, and Sarai Montes are working on to try to get a, a good sense of what Berkeley students would like in an app like this um, so that we, can find um, the accessibility aspect of the app, but also in terms of what's, what would be uh, useful when um, applying this to a university or, um, uh, yes, uh, definitely a university setting in this context. Um, and we are working on three different projects. And again, we are mo mostly uh, self-trained in this regard. That is, we're, we're entering, um, a field that we know a little bit of, and we're still testing out. We're actually really excited just to test out um, how things work. Uh, we have Winston and Liz and Nigel working around Unity to see how to create some of these different uh, AR um, environments. Um, we're using the HoloLens um, to see how we, we might be able to create a HoloLens app as well using the HoloLens um, as a as a mixed reality VR and AR uh, component to this, um, and of course, right now because I think the Adobe um, uh, Creative Cloud is offers us so many opportunities to use um, these programs to continue to use Adobe as it continues to update its its projects. Um, in regards to Unity, uh, this is around. Um, since much of Unity is uh, geared towards gaming, how to be able to now use that in regards to AR pr predominantly. Um, Nigel and, and others have mentioned around the question of AI uh, as, as also something that's being worked here. Um, and, and so we're really trying to ask questions to think of ethnic studies, um, not in 2023, but in the next 50 years and what that might actually mean. Um, because we know that in ethnic studies, it one of the major components of that is the question of history and also uh, making sure that there's an archive. But we also feel that the accessibility of that archive and its connection to the broader communities, both in the United States and across the globe, is a crucial element to the access to knowledge. And also the access to knowledge leads to encounter and dialogue. And, and, I and we feel that these types of programs, especially um, through uh, these kinds of applications might give us an opportunity to, to, to really push for that. Um, we wanna keep it short because we wanna talk to you all. Um, the HoloLens as something that we wanna use, knowing that HoloLens is used for industry, well, it should also be used in that regard for educational industry. And we've looked at some of the 
recent apps that are on HoloLens. And we feel like learning how to use that in the context of especially the library services on a campus like Berkeley would expand tremendously. Uh, the way that we think about AR in relationship to um, knowledge production and storytelling in this context, yeah. Um, and so we're we're hoping that this is something in the future that we can collaborate with other units on campus that are using it in distinct ways. I believe there's a group that has used it for uh, Egyptology and in terms of creating VR um, uh, scenes or, um, on different tombs and so forth. So be in conversation around the use and also be in conversation around troubleshooting what that might look like any whether it becomes ethical or also when it comes to um, just the technical aspects of it and we know that the applica you know the application wise it has to be cool for students to be able to also use to be able to have a sense that this is something that can now become um, normalized in everyday use for students Again, if it's used in social media, especially when it comes to filters or in, on TikTok or in Instagram and other forms, why can't it also be used in regards to um, information when it comes, uh, in this case, to knowledge production that um, they themselves produce or that um, are included already in the archives of libraries on, on the Berkeley campus or in other campuses? And Again, we're beginning, I think, not from scratch because we have amazing support um, from, from you all, um, especially from uh, Bill in the CT, uh, CTO office. But we are definitely thinking like, where do we start? We're starting trying to uh, brainstorm and branch out what, um, ask both people in the industry because we are in the location of that industry here in the Bay Area, but also to try to um, think of not what would be best use right now, but what would uh, um, kind of last uh, the next 10 years, next 20 years. Um, so that it's something that again, future generation cohort of golden bears could be able to use. Um, are we using the right software platforms? Um, and how do we produce the core features in these experiences that we wanna create? These are some of the questions that we've been asking ourselves in this process. Um, that this is, you know, I'm sorry it took a little bit too long. We just kind of uh, wanted to uh, talk about these things, myself and Nigel, but we'll take any questions, comments, or just uh, thoughts that people have, yeah? Thank you so much. That was really fantastic. Um, all right, we'll go right to Greg. Greg, you have a question or your hands up. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Professor Gonzalez and Mr. Hawkins for, for sharing this, this important work. And I actually have that one specific uh, question for Mr. Hawkins. Uh, you mentioned how culture suffers in kind of digital and online realms. And I'm curious if you could expand on that a little bit for us. You know, is it is it that real world systemic issues simply carbon copying themselves, the digital realm? Are there are, are there new or different challenges and so on? Well, I, I'll just say that there's um there's an amount of gatekeeping that uh, that that keeps a certain um, population of the campus, or even in in particular areas, that um, that keeps certain creativity out of out of uh, having a chance to produce itself, or recreate itself, or develop itself. Um, and um, I guess I'm passionate because um, there's something called a sociologic sociological imagination, right? And it's basically understanding how outside is doing and and recognizing your chances in that world from your special your, your social space and um so when i ride my bike throughout my community i see a bunch of things that are changing i see a, a amazon here i see facebook over here that are just you know just doing great you know but a, around it you know there's there, there hasn't been any help at all so um I think what fuels my passion is being able to uh, have the youth use their phone and pull up to this one stop sign and see see how um, see how everything changed or see what was once there and you know get, give a snippet of the culture before it's gone and um, I feel like um, being in this position um, right now it's it's um, it's important. 
that I learned these tools. Like I've actually took a course in uh, digital humanities and it opened my mind to coding, what I can do with my research and all those things. And how, how cool would it be for me to be able to use that research and, and teach it in an interactive world to, to, to kids that probably don't really think about school, you know? Um, you know, it's, it's important for me, you know, and, uh, and it's also really cool to me. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. And, you know, I've ridden my bike on more than one occasions off that bridge, right? Facebook and East Palo Alto. And, and there's, there's uh, I, I'm sure there's lots and lots I don't see. And I can only imagine if that can sort of be brought, brought to life, you know, the, the, the possibilities are really tremendous. Thank you very much. Yes. I will, I will say that, you know, we're definitely also working on curriculum when it comes to this. We've already worked on a bit of curriculum using Art of Ive um, to, to use it for the formation of particular cultural artifacts or production, especially around uh, foodways, um, soundscapes. Uh, and, and we were published as part of a kind of a digital collection of different universities who are working on digital humanities. Um, I'll send a link to, to Bill who can probably send it out to everybody where, where they're located. Um, and we were excited to see that our, our two lesson plans for creating that were accepted because I think part of that is also creating a, uh, that dialogue across uh, different disciplines um, and communities around this question of what it means to continue to produce culture and maintain, and, and also the politics of culture uh, within this particular space, yeah, or these spaces. Thank you. I have a question. Um, so I was part of the team that originally launched what's called Productivity Suite, and it's like the Adobe tools were part of that. And, you know, part of the original vision that we had was this would put these tools in the hands of all of the Berkeley community and make that access to those tools such as it is however you know as i i wonder how you approach now that's in the ecosystem of things that are at berkeley but it's also has sort of borders around it and if you want to go out into the community then these are expensive tools and i've heard other questions from some of my students asking about like why they can't run them because the resources on their laptop isn't sufficient to run like some of the video production tools i wonder if you've encountered that and how you think about issues like equity in the software that you're choosing and how that affects how you tell your story? A great question, Bill. I've, one of the things that we've done is also train high school students in podcasting. And we we create tutorials in Adobe Audition. Mind you, this is, to, to, <laughs> this is our own understanding of, of actually collecting tutorials here and there. Um, I've participated here in the Advanced Media Institute uh, around teaching when they teach or they train folks in podcasting and using a lot of that information to create our own accessible tutorials. And I, what I noticed around high school students was they don't have access to the cloud, right? And in fact, they do have computers, but they're Chromebooks. And Chromebooks are what I call them glorified uh, web browsers. And so they're not able to like, you know, use the Chromebooks because they you can't get the applications that they need or the programs that they need to edit audio, for instance, at least in that context of, say, for instance, you, using Audition that comes in, in, in as part of the Adobe tools, right? And so we the way that we've worked, at least with that, is to try to locate, um, make do with, with very little, make a lot with very little, find a free um audio editing software um uh, using using whatever possibility for audio recording that um something as limited as say for instance a student's chromebook might have um and still be able to produce high quality um audio files with that we teach students not with microphones but with their cell phones to record so be able to use that in the context of producing podcasts in terms of AR, that's where we want to locate ourselves, to be able to uh, find that and bridge that accessibility aspect of it. 
Um, Artivive, you can put it on a smartphone, but not everybody has, again, the ac accessible to a smartphone, even in, in the communities that we want to reach or amplify, right? Um, so to be able to do something that is available to, uh, to students, but also to the uh, to other communities and be in conversation with them for them to add assets to it is something that I think we were um, centered around doing um, in, in this project. Great, thank you. Any questions, other questions from the group or um, also if you wanted to use us for any of the feedback or questions you had, we'd be happy to do that too. Um, now, just, I will say that you you have access to the studio. All of you have access to the studio if you ever want to use it. It's for, for the Berkeley campus. Um, and we would love for you all to come and visit in terms of setting time to meet with us and maybe continue this conversation. If you have questions, uh, you can always email me or the SSBC at berkeley.edu email. And we would love to continue this conversation now as part of the group. Nigel, you wanted to say something? Oh. Sorry, I was just gonna say, uh, echoing off what you had previously said that, um, um, yeah, we are us literally using our creativity and looking at these apps like Pokemon Go, Waze, all these things just to um, create a, a, sp a specific kind of world that's gonna um, that's gonna lift off um, for, and I'm I'm certain it will. Um, and what we're doing is once we approach these roadblocks, um, we make that our homework assignment, you know. Um, regardless of how much skill we have on all levels, we are collectively joined on this on this project. And uh, I guess my question for you all is, um, is would there be a possibility if we could um, ask you questions in the future, um, if we do um, encounter some of these roadblocks, if we can get some of your input or, you know, some a little bit of direction, you know, that's that's really what I would like to know. I see nodding. <laughs> so yeah, you know, uh, you definitely can tap both our cloud community of practice. And frankly, if you have a Berkeley ID, you're welcome to join the com cloud community of practice. And there's probably 160 people who span mostly IT roles, um, but you can send questions and have discussion topics in there. And certainly if there's something that's of interest or concern or, or something around cloud computing and like some of these tools, that in the way that it impacts the curriculum and that question gets raised, we can bring in, like I see Owen McGrath here from Research Teaching and Learning, we can bring the right people into a conversation to, um, to at least talk about it. We don't, you know, most of us, our budgets are in terrible shape and we can't necessarily, you know, handle things that way, but, you know, certainly among the people here, there's gonna be interest for sure. I don't know, others, Rick, if you have thoughts, Amy. I was thinking about Rick as well. I was like, Rick, do you know these folks? And y'all should be talking and know each other. Rick works closely with the museums. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. It's nice to meet you both. I, and there've been, um, I had a couple, a bunch of thoughts and they're not really well formed into questions, but there've been digital storytelling and youth media efforts for decades, you know, on campus and, and off obviously. And so the podcasting and some of that just really feels like in that, you know, continuing that good work. Um, and then I was also thinking about all this stuff that you produce. Um, how do you save it? How do you make it available? How, how, how is it going to get kept? Like you're in the library looking at the stacks and trying to figure out how to make that stuff available to people. How's your stuff going to be available? And I know there's been a lot of thought put into that by people like Clifford Lynch and others. And so I'm hardly an expert in any of this, but I'm really interested in it. And that's a great question. Um, and and right now, you know, I'm hoping nothing ever happens to me. Uh, I hold the passwords for most of this stuff, <laughs> but but it's more. It it definitely is something that we want to institutionalize. That is that um, in this it, it, precisely that we want to work with the ethnic studies library, which can be, I think, the uh, steward of much of these things. And that's that's who we anticipated doing that when we first got the CTO Changemaker grant. Um, because we wanted to work with these units on campus that are the more obvious choice uh, to hold these um, as some of the hearts on campus. We, we think of the libraries on this campus 
uh, from the Bancroft to the Ethnic Studies Library to what uh, the, you know the Anthro Library as hearts of of this campus. I mean, that's what I think you know they're made of. This campus is made of in terms of knowledge production, and so we want to be uh, be able to hand them that. But that's why also um, such applications like Art of Vive and so forth are limited for us. We want to be able to create something where we can hold them um, uh, and and have them accessible and add assets to it. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the um, questions that we, we are asking ourselves, how to be able to do that as well. Um, we have over 100 podcasts as they continue to be produced by students and classrooms. That's going to continue to expand. Um, and so we want to be able to hold them um, and also be, be made accessible to um, different uh, places like Spotify and so forth that they're not available. So we always... Uh, help students create their own uh, anchor uh, FM, .fm uh, sites, which are free uh, server sites, so that they can now see them on Spotify um, and Apple uh, Music and so forth. So we're trying to locate free accessible means to be able to do that, um, knowing that cost, especially monthly subscriptions and stuff like that, are not necessarily accessible, not only to students, but to the communities that also are, are producing this kind of work. That's all really exciting. Thanks. Uh, Greg. Yeah, a, a question for either or both of you, Professor Gonzalez or Mr. Hawkins. Um, just on the technical side, um, are, does the, the current phase of work or work to date uh, involve the, um, any of the resources with the major cloud providers, Amazon's, AWS, Microsoft Azure, or the Google GCP? Yeah. We're, 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 for our purposes, is like how, how, how to be able to create, or not create, but to plug into cloud ser uh, services and so forth that, um, that, that, that are positioned here at the university and can help, help us with this as well, um, which we're excited to have these conversations with you all as you're working on projects that maybe um, uh, can help us with resources around that or, or people to talk to, to people much smarter than us. <laughs> do can uh maybe d d d different knowledge areas yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely no ranking yeah <laughs> we can't all specialize in everything so that's right that's right that is and that's part of the vision of the power of the community is there isn't like a secret pantheon of the experts here of some secret technology it's kind of all of us trying to figure this out together and then uh, Owen put in the chat, uh, this was actually another change maker grant awardee, the um, XR, the extended reality community of practice. So that's, um, they've, they've gotten this off the ground and it would be a perfect um, connection point also. Oh, wonderful. Some of the work you're doing, the link is in the chat. I just, look, I just clicked on it. Man. Well, a lot of us have a, an all staff meeting to go to it too. But this was fabulous, and I, I hope that we get to keep in touch with you, and I hope that people heard, and we'll get the word out um, if you want. Be careful what you ask for, but they have a fantastic podcasting studio and a lot of really cool equipment and people there, so it's definitely worth checking out. And that's at, uh, it's at the website, right, SSBC? Yes, it's, I'll put it in the, in the chat right now. It's in 562 uh, Social Science Building. Thank great. you for sharing all the links and everything. The artwork of is course, just great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to digging in. Thank you all, and I hope you all have a wonderful day, yeah? All right, thank you. Great to see everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Right. Thank you.